First thing I want to do is just uh, thank everyone for giving us a little bit of time this morning. This is this is a really exciting uh, session that we're, we're rolling out. Um, it's, it's been in the works for some time. Uh, we originally had the intention of launching this panel a little bit uh, prior to summer. Um, and then as we got closer in, we started seeing some significant market shifts in secondary markets. We thought, hey, you know, let's let's see what happens after these summer months, because we know secondary markets, specifically some of the ones that we're speaking to today, um, are going to go through some dramatic shifts. And, uh, and we thought, what better way to, to wrap up and in, in move into the fall with, with a quick summary of what's happening there. So um, what I want to do is, uh, is I want to just quickly start with... Uh, with, with why we're here today. So um, as, as many of you know, my name is Ryan Lalonde, um, president of MLA Canada. Um, and this is a real estate intelligent market meetup. This is a spotlight on secondary markets today. Uh, it's a live event too, which is something that we're really excited about. Uh, and we're gonna dive deep into secondary markets running throughout British Columbia. We think these are some of the key markets. Um, personally excited because today's panel has a serious depth of expertise. Uh, we have some critical uh, leaders within each of these marketplaces. This is the Okanagan. This includes uh, Whistler, the island, uh, and of course, the Fraser Valley. Um, some of the smartest minds are going to be sharing um, uh, what they're seeing around value proposition, some of the recent migration uh, demand that's shifted from different parts of British Columbia into new secondary market parts. Um, and then, of course, uh, we're going to be speaking a little bit about the, the unhinging of those live work expectations and how that's really had a huge impact on uh, the hunt for affordability in markets outside of the lower mainland. Uh, it's important to know that our MLA advisory team is playing a, a very active role right now in shaping and supporting programs in each of these submarkets. So um, on a whole, we are working with about $7 billion of real estate throughout the lower mainland uh, in British Columbia. Um, and, and a part of some of, and luckily a part of some of um, uh, the most sought after real estate that, that operates in these marketplaces. Um, my hope today is that we're going to have a really robust discussion. So we're going to focus on the conversation around how these marketplaces have changed over the past 12 to 24 months. We're going to look a little bit at the demand depth of each of these markets. That's been a hot topic within our boardroom and by many of our customers and viewers um, that are viewing in from the Pulse. Um, and then we're also going to look at some of the long-term viability of each market to support these record uh, level demands and, and obviously the record level pricing that's uh, 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 falling out of it. Uh, so just a quick little snapshot. Um, we're, we're, we, we have this incredible panel. Many of the individuals represent some of the strongest brands and some of the most intelligent people um, and professionals in these respective markets. We're really lucky to have their time today. Um, I can't tell you how challenging it is to organize uh, top performing brokers like this. Um, we have five panelists that are going to be joining in. I'm, I'm going to give a quick introduction to them very shortly. Um, uh, as I shared earlier, we're hitting Whistler, Victoria, Fraser Valley, and the islands. Um, I think it's going to be a really good chat. Today's format, we're setting aside 45 minutes um, for some deep dives into each, each marketplace. Um, I doubt that's going to be enough time, so we're going to have to cut it short. I have, again, some timekeepers that are going to do a good job of keeping me orderly. Um, we've allocated about 15 to 30 minutes for Q&A if we need it. Um, and, and what I've shared with them prior to jumping on is like the very best panels are the ones where there's a lot of disagreement uh, and strong opinions. So we're going to do our best to make sure that uh, we're digging deep and, uh, and that everyone's really sharing an honest opinion about what they think is going to happen in, in specific markets. Um, I'm, I'm also going to encourage that everybody that's viewing in, uh, do your best to fire us questions through the chat. I highly recommend this. We have a team of advisory leaders behind us. If there's some specific market data, they're going to be crunching this data um, and sharing it out with the chat. Um, if it requires a little bit more time, we'll be circulating that data out to the group afterwards. Um, we also have live questions that I'm going to try to tackle with the panelists if they're uh, above the bar that we need them to be. Um, and I suspect a couple of them will be. Um, now, really important to note, don't text me. Uh, if you text me, I'm not going to get to it. These are some of the... The, the best brokers in uh, the province. These guys and girls are very good at talking. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a hard time probably wrangling them. Um, and we're going to try to keep them focused on the topics at hand. Um, and so if you guys are comfortable, we're going to jump right into this and, uh, and try to kick this off. The first that person that I'm really proud to introduce is actually Maggie Thornhill. Uh, this is a privilege to have her uh, uh, founder of, um, of Whistler and Angle Vokers top producer um, at EV in 2018. She's been selling Whistler real estate for 34 years. Her uh, Maggie and her son, Max, uh, do an incredible job. We've worked personally with them uh, many, many times. Uh, Maggie, thank you so much and welcome uh, to the show. Thanks, guys. It's great uh, to be here. 
Uh, really looking forward. We've had a lot of a lot of our clients, of course, that work in the Lower Mainland and, and in the Okanagan have so many questions about uh, Whistler Real Estate. So I'm looking forward to jumping into that. Uh, next up, we're, we're going to touch on Steve Thompson. Uh, this is South Okanagan and Penticton. Um, I'm from Penticton, and I can tell you that if you live in Penticton, you know who Steve Thompson is. This guy's been selling more real estate in, in that part of the world than anyone else that I can think of for as long as I can think of. He's, he's a giant in that space. Steve, thank you so much. Um, you're with uh, Team Thompson, obviously, real estate, over 30 years, similar to Maggie, and, and been a part of many, many transactions, probably one of the biggest transaction volume teams in the Okanagan. Welcome and thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, next up, we, we have Jessica Russell, Russell joining in from Victoria, regional sales manager for MLA Canada. We have a variety of active programs there that we're chasing. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of industry expertise in three major Canadian markets, pre-sale specialists, so very keen on data and also very keen on buyer segments. So really, really lucky to have you on, uh, online here, Jessica. Thanks for joining. Of course. Um, Taylor Masseau, uh, it is a pleasure as well, uh, Director of Sales Okanagan, uh, of, the, of the Okanagan Sales Programs for MLA Canada. Um, you oversee Central Okanagan and Kelowna. Um, you, again, very similar to Jessica, uh, 10 plus years of, of expertise in pre-sale, uh, worked in almost every major market across Canada. Uh, you've been active in the Kelowna marketplace, both in resale and pre-sale for some time. Your expertise is going to be uh, uh, well noted today. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Ryan. Looking forward to it. And then last but not least, we, got, we have Cameron McNeil. Um, uh, Cameron is an executive director with MLA Canada. Uh, it says 30 here, Cam. I, I was, I was going to say more, but 30 years of experience in pre-sale. Uh, yeah, it was, well, it, the real number is, is uh, 29. So I was licensed in 92. But then, um, then Jessica looked over my shoulder and saw this very out-of-date photo of my kids. My kids are now <laughs> taller than I am university. And she's like, you need a new photo. <laughs> so uh, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's been a while. And as, as uh, the older people on this panel know, time seems to accelerate. <laughs> um, indeed. Uh, well, thanks for thanks for joining in too, Cam. Uh, Cam's going to be speaking um, uh, to some of the perspective around the Fraser Valley, and then some of the other perspectives that we have um, uh, around the British Columbia marketplace. So I'm going to just jump into this, guys, and, and kick us off. Uh, we're going to start with Maggie. And Maggie, I'm going to set you up here. Um, hey. 2021, you know, uh, it continues to kind of shake the foundation of market activity. We've had record breaking months now, uh, not only in traditional Vancouver urban markets, but also in BC rural markets. Um, we have a new value formula that's absolutely emerged. Um, and it's really difficult to say where this market is, is going. Today, um, what I'm hoping to, 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 to reach and discuss with you is, is a little bit of background about what's happening in Whistler. Uh, the benchmark is up um, nearly 23% over the past 12 months. Uh, Whistler was already priced high. Uh, this is one of the most aggressive um, appreciating markets that Whistler's ever seen. Really curious on what's happening in that market today, Maggie. It's, it's been remarkable. Um, I think COVID obviously has changed the look and the way people use Whistler. Um, when COVID first hit, we all thought, oh gosh, you know what's going to happen. Um, but within three months, we started seeing a lot of people who may, they know Whistler, may, they might have come up two or three times a year, but suddenly they were buying homes here because they needed a place to go. Did we lose Maggie? Yeah. Oh, Maggie, we might have. There we go. Oh, we lost you for a moment. Oh gosh, are you? Am I back? You're back. Did you get all of it or not? Should I start again? Um, we lost you rate right as I think the, we might have, you might have hit the mute button, but we lost you rate right as um, families were coming up two to three times. Yeah, so people knew Whistler, but weren't using it the way they're now using it. So people started to look and buy. We, we saw the biggest changes in large, expensive homes. Typically in a year, we'd sell maybe seven, eight homes over five million. In 2020, we sold I think it's at 36 homes. Um, so suddenly we saw this huge influx of wealthy, there's a lot of money in Vancouver, as we all know. And suddenly we started seeing these families buying expensive homes so they could bring their families together, have a place because they weren't traveling anywhere else. Um, and those families became so it was it was a surprise to them when they spent as much time as they were spending here to see what a livable town this is. 
so we sort of had this shift from being just strictly a rental or resort town to being seen as a almost as a residential place people were buying homes because they needed a home office they could actually come and live in their home in Whistler work from Whistler um, and then when they're not working enjoy everything Whistler had to offer so it really had a big shift in in that res respect that we 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 sell stuff very fast very very quickly um, and the pricing just got higher and higher because the demand was so much greater than the supply, which is of course economics 101. When there's you know little supply and huge demand, the prices go up, and we've seen that dramatic increase. Um, so yeah, no, it, it's it's been a dramatic change for us. You know, I I, I have to ask because when you when you think about uh, you spoke about young families and you spoke about um, those uh, within British Columbia finding Whistler. Some of them, some of them um, re envisioning how they were using it, and others actually finding it for the first time. Are you seeing a, a significant shift in buyer segments in the active resale markets um, at different price brand at different price bands in that market? Um, yeah, you know what we're seeing is obviously there's budgetary concerns here because we're pushing a lot of the local families out because they can't afford it. And they're going off to places like Squamish or into Pemberton. We've seen a massive increase in Pemberton, not just from local people moving there, but also Vancouver looking at that as their country house. Um, so we've also seen this massive increase in pricing happening very close to us. It's sort of the whole corridor is being affected. And as people can't afford one sector, they're moving to another one, but they're still staying. We, we think that one of the things that's so special about Whistler is that we're an hour and a half from a major urban center. And that's the seen to be the best commutable distance where people can actually commute. Um, and I think that has been a, such a blessing for us to be positioned where we are so close to a massive urban center. You know, um, Whistler has been a, a second home to to my family, and uh, and I know Cameron would feel the same way. And Maggie, you actually uh, were part of making that happen for us some time ago. Um, what I uh, what I've been really in, in, uh, intrigued by, though, is is the number of um, young families that have really moved into that marketplace over the coming over the coming months, and specifically in the last twelve to twenty four. But rents have also continued to appreciate quite dramatically, uh, and it feels like there's a strong relationship between. Airbnb rental rates and pricing demand today, uh, and would you say that 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 relationship um, uh, and rental rates is is driving up uh, values, or would you or, or do you see them as as somewhat separate? Um, yes and no. Um, obviously, the rental market got hit very badly for the first eight, 10 months of the COVID, and and suddenly people, go, oh my God, how can we keep because nobody was coming here. But then once things started to open up and now we are getting, I mean, I, I have pretty tight notice. Uh, I know this quite well because my younger son has a rental company. Um, and I know from what he's finding is how the market's happening. A lot of Airbnb is people like to do their own thing and they are getting good revenue. Um, but there's a point where people just can't afford it. You know, I think, and the pricing to get into that market isn't going to make it so easy to do it. If you've got to pay 1.8 million for a two bedroom property, it's gonna be really hard to sustain the amount of income you need to, to you know, look after that place. So I think there's a, it's gonna be sticky, but it's there and people want to be in Worcester and if they wanna be here, they're gonna to have to pay. And it's the same thing. If you can't get anything, you just pay the money. It was like me coming through the board yesterday. I had to get a test and it didn't matter that I had to pay 300 bucks for the test. I needed to be there. I almost was ready to pay the $6,000 fine because I had to get home. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think that's well said, and, and uh, I tend to agree. It, it does feel like uh, Whistler is an expensive place, but it's a highly amenitized um, uh, market as well. And, and out of that comes real lifestyle, which so many are chasing now in a very different way than what they were maybe 24 months ago. 
I'm going to, I'm going to direct attention uh, over to Steve uh, just for a moment. Like, you know, so much of what you were sharing, I'm curious, uh, Steve, when you think about the Okanagan, specifically the South Okanagan, how much of what Maggie just shared applies to what you're seeing in parts of like say Penticton, Summerland, all of our serious. Yeah, it's, it's very similar, I suppose, in a larger scale dollar wise. Um, our market values are, of course, lower than Whistler in the lower mainland, but they have seen some serious a capital appreciation. So really through COVID, when March, April hit a 2020, you know, everyone was saying, what the heck is going to look like? You know, it was, it was pretty scary. And what we found was May, it just started to pick up a bit. And then from June onwards, it's, it's been insane. And the calls that I was fielding and my colleagues were fielding on a regular basis as we got deeper into the year was calls a lot from people from the lower mainland. And the story was we're working remotely. It looks like we're going to continue to. And um, we're thinking of uh, moving from the lower mainland and getting into the Okanagan. And uh, so, you know, you chat with what their search requirements are, you know, set them up on the, the private client services and, the phone would ring a couple of weeks later and, you know, we sold, we had multiple offers, we're on our way up to buy. And that happened time and time again. So big influx again from out of areas. The, the interesting part was what we were typically seeing, if we go back, you know, the last 25 years, we're very much a kind of retirement community. And, and we kind of lack the, again, the, the, you know, working folk, the young families. But what we've been seeing um, certainly of late is we're getting people coming up that are, you know, they're in their forties or early fifties. They're, you know, they are now working again, working remotely and are able to move here with their kids and live in a pretty cool community with a ski hill 45 minutes away to big lakes and you know sell out of uh, the lower mainland and and again that's again a, a common situation so they're typically we just had someone from cloverdale last week they had uh, 24 offers on their property a week ago tuesday um, sold 175,000 over ass so they sold at one five they came up spent thanksgiving weekend with me and they spent one one you know so they're now in a wonderful position this young family um, to enjoy the Okanagan with a small mortgage. You know, I'm, I'm really curious about this, this topic you have, uh, you know, not too dissimilar of a story to what, to what Maggie had shared and my understanding of, of, of the Okanagan was similar to what you had just uh, uh, positioned. You have um, this, this pendulum has swung out um, as a result of COVID. And, and, um, and as that's happened, we spoke a little bit about that new value for me, but specifically that unhinging between work and, and live um, and people willing to now potentially commute from secondary markets into the city a few days a week if necessary, but the majority of the work would be done um, um, remotely. How much depth do you think and time there is for that to continue to establish itself? Like, do you feel like we're going to see that pendulum swing back and there'll be an exodus or do you feel like the depth of demand for, for Penticton is going to continue? I think the I think the demand will continue overall, but I think that pendulum could swing back a bit. You know, there may come a time where companies feel uh, our employees are a little more productive if they're in the office than working from home, and so you might may see uh, a little of that down the road. Time will tell. Right, and you have you know tw uh, value appreciation about, and this is a broad stroke, um, but twenty one percent appreciation over a twelve month period, which is just a an incredible outcome um, for, for a marketplace that didn't necessarily see the same growth as other parts of British Columbia um, five to seven years earlier. And so I guess of that 21%, do you, do you think that it's going to hold um, and that these prices are establishing itself as being long-term foundations? Or do you feel like this is a moment in time that could come backwards? Yeah, my feeling at 21 is, is accurate. Uh, if we were actually to rewind to, let's say, March, April of 2020, uh, you know, we're closer to 30%. So there was a, even a growth in that period of time, I'd say from you know, June, say through to end of September, we saw some appreciation during that time. So the biggest uh, change has been in the single family detached. I would say that is definitely up over 30%, but the townhouses and condos aren't far behind. They're you know, 22 to 25%. Um, in Penticton, here's the thing, as far as you look at future values, we, We've got this, I don't know how familiar the panel are with Penticton, but you've got two large lakes, you've got um, and a city in the middle. 
Um, we've got a lot of land on the east side, which is all ALR land, which is vineyards and orchards, which keeps our beauty. It's not going to get developed. And then on the west side, you've got First Nations land. So the challenge that we have is we don't have, like Kelowna, we don't have the, the expanse of flat land for development. We've got a few little pockets in the northern sector and a bit in the south, but, but we have a severe lack of supply. And so with the demand, which I feel will continue, especially as more and more of the boomers and the boomers are coming in for retirement, I think that we're going to see uh, some more capital appreciation over the next five years. Uh, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, if, I, I think what I want to do is I want to, I want to kick the ball over to, to Taylor here and, and, you know, uh, Taylor, uh, uh, you have so much uh, experience in uh, the Kelowna marketplace, um, uh, both in pre-sale and in resale. I'm curious, uh, how does what Steve just shared square against what you're seeing in that marketplace? And is there uh, specifically the buyer segments is what I think many, many of our um, viewers are interested in. How have they shifted over the last 12 months? Yeah, I mean, I think I would echo a lot of what Steve has said, where they're coming from larger cities like Metro Vancouver and making their way to the Okanagan just for a difference of lifestyle. The, um, you know, maybe the one thing that may differ in terms of Kelowna versus Penticton is, is we do have an international airport. So we're starting to see a much larger transition of people from the East Coast. So larger cities like Toronto that are coming here. Um, and it's the same, you know, type of play where they're selling for a couple million bucks in Toronto and they're coming out here spending half of that. And now in their early forties, they're really well set up to give their family a, a nice lifestyle that they may not have been able to do um, in those cities. So I would say over the last five years, that's been the biggest transition is instead of just seeing Vancouver and Alberta, we're starting to see the West coast or sorry, the East coast um, come out here a lot stronger. And I, again, it's, it's changing the demographic from Kelowna being, and the Okanagan really being more seen as sometimes a retirement plan or a retirement community to one of growth and, you know, where young families are coming and the Okanagan now has such major schools and universities and trades programs. And it's just fielding more young people coming here, uh, which is great to see the demographic shift and it not just be viewed as somewhere to downsize and retire to. So that's definitely changed over the last few years. Uh, the uh, the presale market in Kelowna has been vibrant over the last 24 months. Um, uh, Cameron and I continue to be very surprised by not only the rate of appreciation of price, but also uh, the, 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 the apparent depth of that marketplace and the ability to absorb uh, high-rise construction. Um, can you touch a little on that a little bit? And, and where are prices at today? And where do you think that they're going when it comes to presale? I mean, it's totally changed. When you look at, you know, you'd said the word absorb, and I always look at absorption rates. And you look back at what a balanced market or what somebody would consider a balanced market is and absorption rates of, you know, properties listed for sale versus what's selling is, you know, it averages around the 20 to 25% mark. In 2008, we saw, you know, a big dip and it was around 4%. And this year, in, in March of this year, our absorption rate in Kelowna was 99.76%. So like you literally could not list something without selling it. Um, and the year to date average is sitting around 75%. So we're seeing a, a really big uptake on our uptick on the inventory. It's just not sitting, we don't have enough inventory. New housing starts are up in pre-construction specifically. I think in September alone, um, Kelowna accounted for close to 20% of the new construction starts in BC. So we're starting to see a lot more pre-construction. And as, as Steve said, we don't have a lot of room to go out. So we're going up and we're seeing a lot more high density and multifamily than we have in previous years. This is a question to both Steve and to you, Taylor. Um, when you think about the, the communities that are feeding um, your market, uh, specifically Kelowna and Penticton, um, it's not too dissimilar to what we have on a world stage, right? We have strong influences from overseas buyers that have a, a global perspective of value, right? That is set off of incredible demand and population growth in their own cities. And as a result, they look elsewhere uh, as, a, as a means to be able to invest their wealth. Um, and they look at cities um, similar to Vancouver or Toronto, when you think about big metropolitan cities. Um, uh, curious though, because as, the, as, as, as investors look towards metropolitan cities like those two, and you see a displacement then of residences that occupy Vancouver real estate looking into new markets, similar to Calgary, 
Uh, what are the two or three supporting uh, metro cities that are driving demand into the Okanagan? Where are those buyers coming out of, I guess is the question. Probably similar to what Steve said, it still is, you know, a big portion of it from the Vancouver market coming to Kelowna. I think that's just more familiarity. We're only a few hours away. You know, they've maybe grown up vacationing here, so they're familiar with the area. Um, but over the last year, I would say we're probably creeping close to 25, 30% of East Coast buyers. Whereas if you asked me that five years ago, it would have been closer to three to 5%. So the East Coast Toronto market, Ontario market, um, has significantly grown over the last couple of years. Yeah, th thanks for that. Steve, would you, I, I'm guessing that you'd probably agree with that. We're, we're quite different, actually. Um, from East Coast, year to date, we're sitting around 5%. So our buyers, and again, uh, part of the reason is we're, we're not uh, an international airport. Um, so, uh, you know, you got to go fly or drive to Kelowna and then Kelowna out. Um, so our, our real drive has been from the lower mainland, about 26% of the people that purchase in the South Okanagan year to date are from the lower mainland. About 50% of the transactions have been uh, local and then the balance is uh, throughout the, the country, but internationally, we're only at 1%. Oh, that's interesting. I think that probably goes back to just awareness too, right? You know, sure. Kelowna is more well known. Um, uh, the airport's a huge factor of that. The university is a huge factor of that. So we have a few more driving factors to the Okanagan, whereas Penticton in the South Okanagan is still a little bit of a hidden gem. Um, and lucky for you. So <laughs> here, your prices haven't skyrocketed as quickly, but it's still a little bit more of a hidden gem than Kelowna proper. Right. I agree. Uh, Jessica, I, I'm going to send this one your way. This is uh, this was one of the the most commonly requested questions that we had coming uh, out of the uh, out of Victoria and the islands. Um, we've seen over 750 properties sell in the past month, predominantly across communities like Victoria, West, Langford, and Saanich. Um, that market seems to be absolutely heating up. Curious, um, the buyers that are moving into that mar into those markets. Um, similar story to what we're seeing in Whistler and the Okanagan. Absolutely. I think it's really interesting to hear everyone speaking and how those shifts are going across all markets, how, you know, we are seeing people from Toronto, we're seeing people from Vancouver, um, people like myself, I recently relocated to Victoria from Vancouver, just looking for a little bit of a different lifestyle. I think COVID kind of changed the way we're all looking to buy homes and where we want to live and um, really looking more to the community uh, that you're living in and the walkability, you know, we're ocean front here. Um, another item here is obviously lack of inventory. Um, so I think that's where those communities had a little bit more um, availability in terms of, of inventory that was available, but we're seeing more developers come out. So Victoria West, you've got Boza development with Dockside Green, which is gonna bring a number of uh, residents to the community. Uh, Aragon made a big impact out in Esquimalt with their town square. So they're gonna have um, commercial and residential. They also brought a rental building there that um, I was a part of that rented out in a matter of weeks. There's just such limited inventory here. So, um, you know, you're still getting your first time home buyers, a lot of downsizers, but a lot of young people, similar to what Taylor was saying, you know, this was definitely a place where people said, you know, newly wed and nearly dead, <laughs> which is, you know, that that's really, really shifted. You're seeing a, a completely different demographic. Um, a lot of people really planning ahead too with their downsizing and looking to places like pre-sale to plan and pull the equity out of their home and, and have a little bit of an easier lifestyle down the road. And, and uh, pre-sale is still pretty new over here. So it's a lot of educating and, and getting those, those buyers in as well. Um, that the, the rental piece is something that's, that's really interesting because when you think about what's happening in Langford and Colwood and, and other markets, uh, there is a lot of rental inventory that's coming online. Curious yes. about your perspective on rates. Are they going to hold? I know market depth seems strong right now, um, but many developers are asking the question, should we be considering adjusting to, uh, to resale or pardon me, to, uh, to for market simply because we're nervous about those rates not being able to hold? Exactly. And I think it's a really interesting question, Ryan. I think everyone's been sort of flip-flopping back and forth. They went from pre-sale into rental and, you know, it's just a matter of responding. And unfortunately, approvals aren't going through as quickly as people would like and the inventory is just not there. Um, you know, coming over from Vancouver, I thought I'd be over here living, you know, in a house or have, you know, such a different um, experience, but there's no rentals available. So I think in response to that, 
there's a lot of rental buildings coming, um, but it, I, it'll be interesting to see what happens to the market when they all arrive. Um, right now, rental rates, we were averaging about 3.6 a square foot, even out in that rental building in Esquimalt. So you're seeing a really good rental right now, but it'll be interesting once there is more rental available. Um, that being said, you've got 20,000 university students coming back to the island now that, now that things are opening up. So um, there's definitely demand. I'm... Um... I'm going to kind of try to shift gears here quickly. And uh, how are we doing for time? I'm giving a thumbs up. So, so far, so good. <laughs> um, I'm going to fire this one at Cam and someone's going to have to cut him off because when we start talking immigration, <laughs> oh my I God. know he gets excited. Uh, but oh my Cam, God. I got my notes right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, immigration. I, I want to hear this from, I, I want to hear the story of uh, everyone's perspective on this panel, but immigration, um, we have a huge commitment, 1.2 million in a very short period of time. Um, and we all know that we have supply problems in, in every single market that we've talked about, plus the lower mainland. Um, curious, Cameron, when you think about um, some of the shares that you've seen today and you think about British Columbia's commitment to, uh, to immigration, how do you think that that squares against what we're seeing in, say, in the Fraser Valley? Well, okay, well, I'm going to Finish with the Fraser Valley. Start macro. What what uh, what uh, remind? What strikes me when I hear this conversation, of course, is just how interrelated all of our markets are, which is which is pretty pretty interesting and very exciting. Um, you're right, Ryan. We've got this huge federal commitment for immigration in the country, and over the last ten years, roughly one in five new Canadians settles in 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 British Columbia. The vast majority of those settle in the GBRD area, and however, you know. As, the word that we've often talked about is people grad, you know, graduate out of Vancouver is kind of a, a term that I've used. And for various reasons, you know, move to some of what we call the secondary markets. I think we've got to relabel that. These are, these are, these are the, the, the bright lights and the most um, uh, amazing places in our province. And uh, even though we've seen this incredible movement um, uh, to some of these new markets, we are not seeing a black hole being created in Vancouver. Vancouver still has basically zero vacancy and also those incredible um, uh, statistics that we're looking at. So we, we, we just simply as a province don't have the supply to be able to accommodate the, the demand. Now, COVID of course has temporarily interrupted our, our, our immigration and it's been MLA's prediction. And I think it's quite obvious that we are gonna see the biggest immigration wave that this country has ever seen in its history in the coming years. It will be something like we've never seen before. British Columbia has had roughly 50,000 new immigrants coming to the province year over year, going up to pre-COVID. In the, in the years ahead, we predict that that will jump between 70 and 80,000. It's a significant jump up of immigration numbers. And we, we, need, we need to be, as a province, need to be able to accommodate all of that. So um, all of these markets are going to be, continue to be, to be pushed. And um, specific to the Fraser Valley, Fraser Valley, uh, you know, has been been a fascinating market for us. We have a we have an office uh, in Langley, and um, and we're very involved in that market. And and um, we knew when we built that office, uh, uh, Ryan, that that was going to be a major growth region for our province for decades. So so we we uh, really committed to to being part of that market, and that's exactly what's happening. Um, you know, 20 years ago, it used to be a bedroom community. It used to be a, a place where people would reside in the in the, in the east of the river, and one member of the household would get in their car in the morning and commute over the Portman Bridge and and earn their income west of the river. And it's not like that anymore. Now it is a going urban metropolis, a going concern that's that's fully well amenitized, and and people are are are, are obviously raising families there, but they're they're also working and, and earning a living there. And so uh, Fraser Valley market has been so hot uh, since, um, uh, you know, since we came out of the, uh, the first initial shock of, of, of COVID uh, in about May of uh, 2019. And it's been red hot ever since. And um, you know, we just can't keep, keep our hands on any of our pre-sale product values are getting pushed and, and there's parallels to all, all of your stories. Um, and it's being driven mostly by people moving out of, out of the areas west of the river, simply realizing that they have more geographic flexibility, realizing that's such a great spot, but it's also affordability. So relative affordability, let's call it, even though values are up 20, 30%, um, 
they're just you know be able to to, to expand their their footprint and space is a luxury um, uh, for many of these buyers. So uh, you know price points have pushed up, but we've got low interest rates and relative affordability to areas west of the river is really driving that. Um, the other interesting thing, of course, is that um, uh, anyone that's not buying for the first time, if they already have a home, they're locking, you know, they're able to, there's been wealth creation. So values have gone up. They're able to parlay that equity into a, into a larger purchase, um, use that leverage. And so we do see that that equity creation in people's principal residence is also a factor to allow people to stretch a little further. I'm sure that's the case with, with many of the other markets here as well. So no. anyways, that's a quick, quick answer. Um, what, what, was that a quick answer? That was quick. That's as fast as I can get. <laughs> um, I asked for a bell, but uh, it's not around. I can't reach it. So. Um, get, you, you touched on one piece there, though, uh, demand. And, and when we think about demand um, metrics right now, specifically around pre-sale, I'm, I'm kind of curious to go growing across this panel here. When, when we're talking about pre-sale and uh, new home creation, we're going to start with Maggie. I do know that this is a little, this isn't a fair question because there's not a lot of new home creation that happens in Whistler. Uh, so let's for yourself, Maggie, let's just focus on, on the hottest part of the market in Whistler right now. And for the rest, we'll talk about pre-sale. Yeah. Um, we, like you say, we don't have any pre-sale. So now it's just places where older cabins are being knocked over and new homes are being built. And I'm sure they are finding the same thing, but our building costs here in Whistler have gone through the roof, ridiculous pricing. So it's not for the faint of heart to buy a lot or an old cabin and knock it over and then rebuild because it's going to end up costing you a lot of money. Um, it, it's, we have a def, definite shortage of single family homes. I mean, right now, I think we've got 122 listings of full ownership in the whole of, of Whistler. So we've got nothing to sell. Um, I think there's getting a little bit of buyer fatigue because so many people are going after stuff and because of the multiple bids, they're not getting what they, you know, they can't get in. So I think there's a lot of sort of, oh God, you know, it's getting weary for some of these people to even try and have a go to get in there. So I think that's one of the things that we're, don't know how to overcome that because we're not getting any, a lot of inventory and I don't see that happening in the short term by any respect. You know, I just can't see what's going to change that unless there's something dramatic that happens in the world. I don't know what's going to change that. Right. And so when you think about um, the, that international demand that Cameron touched on, and I think Steve was, was, touched, was, was kind of just scratching at the surface of it, um, when you think about that international demand, and, and departure gates are going to open up, it might, we thought it was going to be this fall, feels like it might not even be next spring, but but at some point within the next 18 to 24 months, it's safe to say that we will have um, potentially a new demographic that is also charging at this market in a different way. Yeah, I think one of the things we're going to see, obviously there's 300,000 expats living in Hong Kong. And I think most of those people are trying to head for the hills. You know, they're not having a comfortable time in Hong Kong now. Um, they've got a lot of choices, but we are going to get some of those people coming and making this their home. We've already seen some of them who've arrived and have made it their home. Um, I, I, I really think that one thing that surprised me when the US border opened, that uh, was what, September, beginning of September, I thought we'd see a flood of US buyers. And that didn't happen. So that I found was something that was quite surprising. Um, we've sold a few U.S. buyers, but really, typically speaking, Worcester is a very big market for U.S. buyers, and that didn't happen when the border opened. So I'm not quite sure about that one, but it's something to be noted. Um, we, like you, are getting a lot of Torontonians coming here. They're making a shift, quite a few of them making the, the move from Toronto to live in Whistler. Um, so it's definitely a shift in the demographic. Um, and the pricing just keeps on going up. And as I say, when you've got so little inventory, I don't know what's going to stop that. Um, I think we're only going to continue growing because we're definitely compared to places like Courcheval in France or Aspen. You know, we're equally as good. We have the amenities we have in my, my feeling, we have better mountains. 
Um, their price per square foot in Courcheval is something like 2,400 US per square foot. In Aspen, it's about 2,250 a square foot US. We're looking around 1. Yeah, 1. 1.5, 1,500, 1,600 a square foot. So we've still got, this is globally, guys. People, we're talking about how the globe is looking at us, where they're coming, where they're looking, where they're placing their money. They, they are looking for value. And they can still see in Whistler, we have got some good room to grow when you compare the pricing of other world-class ski resorts. So I think that's going to stand us in good stead for a long time to come. I think that's such a fair, uh, uh, such a fair share. It's something that we speak about regularly when we look at premium locations uh, like tier one, grade A real estate. Uh, it is with an international lens that uh, that buyers are are setting value, and uh, I think Whistler absolutely stands tall in that regard. You know, Maggie, uh, I'm just one quick last one. Uh, if you're thinking about the price range buckets, um, you know, townhouses kind of around the two million dollar mark, single family around the three or single family around the five to seven, what of those tiers do you think is, are gonna be some of the most aggressive in terms of price growth as you try to make up that difference between where we are today and say Aspen? Um, I think some of the most aggressive is going to be in the five to 20 million. I think the upper end is going to still, you know, there's a huge amount of wealth in the world and they don't mind spending an extra five million if it means getting it. Um, we haven't got, we are seeing, of course, we're seeing in every segment, we're seeing really good increases. But I think where you're going to see the most dramatic is in the absolute upper end of the market. That's interesting. And that's not too dissimilar to what, to, to our feelings around uh, premium real estate in the downtown core, specifically around luxury uh, yeah. offerings. Yeah, these are the people going to come in from Hong Kong or from, you know, wherever. Um, and they're going to come in and, and find that perfect, maybe perfect home. Um, they'll come in and they've got plenty of money and they'll, if that's the house they want, they're going to buy it. And if it costs them an extra five or 10, they're going to buy it anyway. Yeah. Um, this is a perfect segue into Steven Taylor. Um, I'm going to ask the same question, you know, waterfront in the South Okanagan would be the equivalent, uh, equivalent to some of the premium real estate that Maggie's talking about. Uh, is that going to be one of the more exciting parts of, of the Okanagan's marketplace? Me first? Sure. Go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. The, the premium real estate here is, um, I think, going to have the, the largest growth. Um, we've already already seeing it actually right now where we've seen a, um, you know, four hour area, um, you know, an old house knocked down, creating three um, really nice size lots. You know, they're, they're around uh, 13,000 square feet, but those lots are a million and a half a piece. And we're just going under contract with one and we've probably got the second one that's going to come and we haven't even registered the, the subdivision plan yet. Um, you know, for us, that's a big number. You know, we a nice view building a lot typically was $500,000, $600,000. But it's, that's a premium chunk just off of, again, you'll know this, Ryan, off of Vancouver Avenue, close to the bench market, looking over the marina and the lake. So prime real estate, not on the water. But then you go to, to the waterfront and we had... Um, we had a, a property that was listed for 1.99, not personally, but a colleague, and uh, it attracted uh, eight offers on it, and it went 751 over the asking price, so it sold 2.75. Um, the house was of no value; it was a, it was a lot value play, um, and the the highest offer actually was 2.6, but the there was a referential offer which said uh, I'll pay $150,000 above the highest bona fide offer, and um, that took it. I, I, I certainly know the location. I, I recall the trails that were all throughout there back in the day and, and the amount of trouble that I got in, in them. <laughs> Actually, there's a few that are joining in that, that were participants in that trouble. Um, the, that, that, that's a really special part of, it, of, uh, of Penticton. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see, you know, there hasn't been as much pre-sale in that marketplace, even though the, for the most part, you still do have you know, some very serious constraints on land supply. Uh, are you expecting more rental or more pre-sale in the future? 
Uh, again, pre-sale is not a common uh, thing here. So typically we had a, a small development, 35 townhouse units that sold this this past year. They were all around the million dollar mark, but uh, they were, I'd say they, in a way they were pre-selling, but they were under construction. So the wait is maybe a year to a year and a half, not when you're talking three to four years down the road. Um, there, there are a couple of uh, developments that are slated. Uh, they're very early stages, um, very prime locations. And uh, my understanding is uh, those developers will be going to the pre-sale market and it will be, again, the longer play, like two and a half to three years. Right. Yeah. Taylor, how does that, uh, how does that um, uh, square against what you're seeing in Kelowna, specifically around who's buying pre-sale there? Because that is a very active part of the marketplace. Um, and do you expect there to be considerable price appreciation in pre-sale from where we are today to where we think we're going to be in, say, 12 months from now? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Both Maggie and Jessica touched on something. You know, Maggie saying a low inventory and then Jessica and her market saying kind of a pre-sale being new and a lot of education with buyers and agents even on how to how to approach pre-sale. We're definitely seeing that here. We've got such low inventory. You know, right now we're setting, sitting at less than a month's worth of inventory. And so these buyers are getting frustrated being outbid constantly and not being able to get in. And they're trying for months and months and months to get something. Whereas when they had started their search to today, the prices are so much higher than they were when they began. They can't get anything. They're feeling frustrated. So they're looking at other options like pre-construction. And that's given us in the pre-construction world a really great opportunity to start educating people on what it means to buy pre-construction um, and what it means to buy something that is two, two and a half year build time. What does that look like? How does that look for an investment standpoint? How does it look for you as an owner occupier? You know, what, a, what does the process look like? Um, you know, in Kelowna over the last few years, I can't remember the last time we did multiple big projects. Um, and this year we had four huge projects come to play, two of them selling out, um, you know, over 150 units each on their first day. So that has just never happened here before. Um, and there's obviously a demand for it. If we can have a building like Aqua sell 154 units in one day and Caban did 127 in one day, Movala sold, you know, close to 80% on their first release and Water by the Park, which is going to be a total of 650 units sold, you know, around 75%. So there's obviously a demand for it and a shift that people are starting to have to think pre-construction and starting to have to think about the two, two and a half year play versus the smaller wood frame stuff at the, the 10 to 12 month build. Uh, thank, thank you, Taylor. Um, that's certainly, uh, you know, we, we, we recently had an incredible success in Kelowna, uh, Caban by Cressy, uh, very much a resort community, uh, a very special piece of property. And, and also one of, you know, one of the, uh, the strongest brands in the local marketplace in Vancouver. Um, uh, and, and obviously a very big sales success. Um, we saw a, a significant amount of transactions fall out of the lower mainland. Um, uh, many of them tied to the Cressy relationship and to, to MLA's relationship. Do you expect that marketplace to, to be able to continue to hold the number of pre, like hold and maintain absorption of the number of pre-sales that are scheduled over the next three years? Because if you look at what's coming in the development permit cycle, there's quite a, quite a flood of pre-sale activity. Yeah, I absolutely think so. Kelowna is the fastest growing city in BC and it's the fourth fastest growing in Canada. So people are coming here quicker than we can find accommodation for them. The vacancy rate on the rental side is, you know, 2% and that's, that's an imp improvement, I guess, from a year or so ago when it was 1.3%. So the vacancy rates on the rental side remain low. Um, the, the drive to come to Kelowna sitting at the 2% um, growth rate year over year. It's just showing a steady you know, flow of people coming here and we cannot build fast enough. We don't have the trades, uh, we don't have you know, the, the manpower to, to build the housing as fast as we need it, to be honest. Like realistically, we just have an overflow of people and, and we're running out of space for them. So it's, it's changing the way things are here for sure. Yeah, th thanks for that. Jessica, how does that, what does that mean to you in terms of, Victoria? Well, I think, again, 
um, you know, it's an active market here, but the sales have decreased 38% since last September. And it's really based on, again, echoing buyer fatigue, not having that inventory. And I think, um, as, as I believe Taylor was saying, there are all these plans for development coming. Um, so you've got big players like Boza coming out, you've got Aragon, you've got Lexi Group out of Vancouver as well. Um, Langford just saw big success with Ledcore property. Um, that was probably closer to something we would have seen in Vancouver in terms of the sell-through rate on that. Um, so moving very quickly. And I think everyone's trying to respond to the demand in the market and um, really you know, buyers are leaning more towards the pre-sale because they do have the opportunity to get into the market and they're not competing against multiple offers. Right. And, and specifically on those pre-sale, who is the buyer? Like if you had to say, you know, what is the majority demographic or target segment of the pre-sale purchaser? It's an interesting question. I mean, it's been such a cross section. Um, from when I first arrived, it was really downsizers and end users. I've started seeing a real influx in investors and people seeing the opportunity. Speaking to vacancy rates, I didn't even know that it was possible, but it's less than 0.1% here. There is just nowhere for people to rent and no opportunity for inventory at this time. So um, you're seeing downsizers, you're seeing people come from Vancouver, Toronto, uh, the Alberta market as well. Um, not as many first time home buyers, but definitely um, their parents helping them out with future looking to, you know, when they're going to be attending university, buying those investment properties where, you know, their children can potentially stay. Um, and then a lot of young couples upsizing from, say, a smaller urban uh, location, a smaller condo downtown, and they're they're moving to the, you know, these secondary neighborhoods, if you will, places like Esquimalt or Langford, where their money goes a little bit further um, and they're able to pull the equity out of their existing homes. Yeah, yeah thanks for that. Um, I, have to, I have to ask, Cam, I'm going to fire this one across your bow. Uh, Townline about to launch Holland Road 2, or sorry, Holland 2. Uh, Holland yes. Road would be a different program uh, in North Vancouver. Uh, Holland 2. And um, obviously Townline having one of one of the strongest brands in that marketplace, um, you know, they, they, they have um, uh, uh, incredible expertise um, across the lower mainland. They're pursuing, they're pursuing some big numbers from a pre-sale standpoint, right? And the expectation is, is that Surrey City Centre is pushing towards mid nines per square foot. Yeah. What does that mean for Langley, a secondary market like Langley yeah. outside of the city in terms of concrete price? Well, listen, I, I think uh, Holland hasn't released yet, but I hear it's going to be around 925, as you said. Um, that's going to be set a new you know, new benchmark for that style of product in Central City, Central City, Surrey. Um, and uh, it, it's absolutely a trickle down effect. We're not quite seeing the density in Langley, um, you know, but let's be clear, we're, we're going to get an extension of the SkyTrain line. We're just going to really start opening up some more urbanization in some of those areas. Um, and and absolutely, I see those values um, continuing to pressure upwards in Langley. Um, it's hard to know long term. You know, we need to remind ourselves that these projects take so long to manifest. Um, Paul and Rowe has been in the books for Townline for five years plus, and you know, finally they're picking a window of time to release it, and then it's going to take three years plus to build it. And so when it's finally delivered, you know, these are long timelines. So how it trickles down to Langley and shows up is really kind of a five-year plus conversation. Um, and so uh, you know, I think that's that that's that comes to mind for me as a very interesting part of this whole conversation. Um, I, uh, man, don't get me started on politics, but I'll just, I'll just remind us all that we had a strong economy in 2017, 18, but we had a made in Victoria real estate slump. And as a result, the entire development community put the brakes on, didn't make sense. It was too risky to bring forward projects. We created a massive supply constraint. That's what's part of what's really showing up and driving all of our markets is we have no supply. There's a great question in the chat asking about what, what we see as panelists as channel as challenges going forward and 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 asking if interest rates are possible. Um, I'm not afraid of interest rates at all. We've got strong demand through immigration. That's not going to change. Charter rights and freedoms allow Canadians to live wherever they want in this country. So you know, as long as the federal government continues to keep immigration flowing, and by the way, our economy needs it, so that's not going to change. Um, you know, interest rates are going to remain relatively low. They could tweak up a little bit, but I don't believe to the amount that is going to be massively meaningful to turning off the tap of demand. And um, what is the biggest issue is constrained supply. And politicians run on this very popular you know, uh, platform about, oh, we're gonna fix affordability and stuff like that. 
And all it does is constrain supply when they start to muddle in this. What we really need to think about is how do we build enough housing to accommodate what will be 70 to 80,000 new people moving into this province every year. And unless we deal with that, all of the values are going to continue to drive up. So, so, so coming back to Langley values, <laughs> <laughs> what's going to happen in Langley concrete? <laughs> oh man. You know, I think, I think that, um, I think because, uh, uh Concrete is very expensive to build, and and uh, so so I think that uh, the municipality is realizing the benefits of having densification, and they're going to be supporting this, and so we're going to see more uh, uh, concrete being released. But this, it, it will have to be over eight hundred dollars a square foot to make any sense of these projects. So I'm going to predict that Langley is going to be in the mid eights in the coming years for concrete. Um, it'll be centered around obvious transit nodes. And, uh, and yet, because of the Fraser Valley still having quite a bit of land and medium density opportunities, um, I don't believe we're going to see a lot of concrete going into Langley in the, in the, in the years ahead. Yeah, I think that's the challenging part is, is like just because you can doesn't mean that you should or that it's needed. And I think yeah. that that'll, that'll really come to fruition over the next 12 to 24 months. But the pricing, what I think that you will see is, is wood frame will continue to rise dramatically and be on par with Surrey. Uh, city center pricing, um, and that'll be quite interesting because uh, that missing that that missing um, tower product uh, will probably come as a secondary um, offering in in two to three years. But it feels like you're right. Some time for the city to to densify before we're seeing 20, 30 story towers in Langley that that are selling out regularly. Um, I'm I'm going to try to wrap this up, guys. I we have some time for that. I wanted to set aside for Q and A. Um, generally, there's not a lot of uh, Q and A engagement, but we do have a few specific questions that uh, that we're going to share. But before we we transition over that, I'd like to just go through each panelist, and uh, I'd like to hear two things from each panelist. Um, the first thing that I'd like to hear is within your marketplace, what will be the hottest product that someone new to that marketplace should be considering? Could be product type, or it could be an area. Um, and two, what is keeping you up at night within that marketplace? What is it that you feel will present the greatest risk uh, over the next 12 months? Uh, and Maggie, if you're okay, I'll start with you. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry, those are big. Those are big questions. Um, what's the, I mean, because we have such a wide variety of property, you know, you go from your fractional ownership for 150 grand up to, $20 million for a house, it's very hard to say what's what to predict is the most. I think I said earlier that the upper end of the market, the five, five million and above is likely a place I would recommend to people. Mm. Um, privacy comes at a premium and a lot of the people who are buying are looking for privacy. Um, I would also say, I don't think there's anything that's keeping me awake at night because I can't do anything about it. You know, why do? Why would I? I don't think I've slept since 2008. I'm like, my God. <laughs> I mean, we're in a pretty lucky position right now. Um, I think we're all very lucky. I think everybody, is, as we've seen on this panel, we've all had a great, a great run. Um, and I can't see it stopping anytime soon. Um, so there's nothing that's worrying me about the market. Um, it will start because things just can't keep on going up and up and up and up and up. That doesn't happen. I've been through so many cycles and you see these ups and then you see the down. So something will create the down. What that is right now, I, I can't put my finger on it. Um, but I think buying in Whistler, buy a piece of dirt, get something that is a Smart. piece of dirt is where I would put my money. Uh, that's, that's sage advice, Maggie. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, I'm just going to go uh, right through left on my screen. So Cam, uh, and we got to, we, we're, we're pushing up against uh, the timelines here. So um, uh, I got to hang out with Maggie more often because I love that her attitude around uh, what you can't control, don't sweat it. But uh, listen, uh, I already hinted, I'll say that one first. Government intervention always keeps me up at, light, at night. It, it always seems to be a, um, it, it exaggerates the pendulum of our market swings, Maggie. It, it, when the government muddles in it, 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 you know, the fundamentals really get out of whack and it swings left and it swings right. 
We all prefer just a steady, easy growing market, which is the way it should be. Um, and, uh, and then of course, what happens is it snaps back the other way and creates this, this craziness that we're in right now. Um, uh, specific to Langley, the hottest, the hottest uh, product types, I, I do agree that, that single family and land will see the most appreciation, but, the mo but, but affording that is, is a smaller segment of the market. Langley, I think, is going to be dominated by family townhome products still. It, it's the place where young families are going to go to raise their children and to have a great lifestyle. And so um, it is also the area that we're seeing a lot of supply. So overall, we're going to see a tremendous amount of creation and consumption of townhomes in the coming years in Langley. And did you answer what's keeping you up? Yeah. Government intervention. <laughs> government, okay, sorry, government intervention. Okay, sorry. Yeah, and, and, and why I don't have an attitude like, like maybe. Oh, that was, <laughs> that, was a, that was a fantastic answer. I like it. Uh, Steve. Uh, as far as I think the, the demand is going to, going to be in a sort of mid-range single family um, market, uh, just to find the housing is going to be the challenge with the amount of people moving here. But from a, a capital appreciation, um, I think it's going to be the luxury market. Uh, people that uh, want the waterfront, the, or the lake view, or the small acreages uh, to have that um, elbow room. Uh, and as we see, you know, over the next few years, of course, you know, every, everyone's parents are getting older. There's going to be some big inheritances, you know, and that's a reality. And so people are going to come into money that's putting them in a position that they are buying properties that they never, ever thought they would actually have a position to own. And, um, and again, retire and possibly come to areas like the Okanagan or Victoria. Um, second question, really, I'm kind of with Maggie. Like, I don't really sweat it too much. You can't control it. So um the market is the market i've done it 30 years just roll with the, the punches and adjust accordingly awesome thanks steve uh jessica um so here um and interestingly enough i'm selling a development out in a squamalt and i'm likening it a lot to previous developments i sold in vancouver and olympic village where you know we really couldn't convince people to buy uh at that time it was going around 500 a square foot you know you're seeing olympic village now as this desirable neighborhood and i'm anticipating that same type of growth esquimalt is six minutes from downtown it's situated right on the waterfront it's got an incredible community um, you've got great facilities all around it's walkable bikeable it's oceanfront it's really everything you need and and i'm lucky to be working on a concrete mid-rise there which at the price points that we're selling right now you know when people are coming from the Vancouver market they can't believe it um, you know we've seen an increase in pricing about 19 percent over last year out in that marketplace and um, it's really becoming a desirable place to be so I think it's a good investment uh, opportunity for sure um, and land prices there as well on single family homes are increasing. A majority of people are looking to, to tear down the homes because there's not a lot of value in the homes, but some great, some great land value opportunity as well. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my take. Um, I think that neighborhood's going to continue to grow. Um, as far as keeping me up at night right now, I think um, aside from my puppy that I adopted a couple of months ago, <laughs> who's definitely keeping me up, um, I would sort of mirror what Cam's saying. And, and uh, one of the questions that came up here is the chief reason for lack of supply. And I think it's, you know, one of the things we're seeing here in both Victoria and the Esquimalt uh, neighborhood is the, the planning and the time that it's taking to push forward um, these developments and, and get things moving. Uh, the, the project I'm selling right now has been in planning since I believe 2017, 2018. So really holding things up. Uh, so hopefully that planning and, and process will move a little quickly and we can get some inventory to market. Uh, thanks for that, Jessica. And I know that Taylor's going to be opinionated on this one. So I'm very, very keen to hear from her. What don't I have an opinion on? Uh, <laughs> I would say some really great opportunity in Kelowna specifically is that longer build out pre-construction just because it's still a little bit of a new thing here. Um, and then the other would sort of echo what Jessica said, those areas that are a little bit outside of the city downtown core, but still close to. Um, so for us, that would be Lake Country or, or West Kelowna, uh, where there's still city centers, they have all the amenities you need, but you're not right downtown in the core. So it's a little bit more affordable to get into and places like Lake Country are growing at, you know, 4% per year. So there's a big demand going in those areas. As far as what keeps me up at night, um, you know what, I think a 
thing about Kelowna is we have a lot of Airbnb type properties and something that keeps me up and stresses me out is people buying these in pre-construction and not understanding how challenging they can be to finance. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very difficult to finance a anything that allows Airbnb versus a traditional um, single family or multifamily. And so just the lack of knowledge on how to go about that would be something that keeps me up up at night and is something that isn't very well educated um, to the general market. Oh, uh, I feel like we could jump into that for a little bit, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting the five minute, 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. Um, you know, if I, if I had to answer uh, the question, you know, the, something that, that I, I'm really optimistic about is, is any piece of dirt that is within a two to three hour drive of, of an international airport that is within one standard deviation of affordability um, on the bell curve. Anything in that, in that market that overlaps in that area is probably going to do quite well from an appreciation standpoint, because I think we're gonna to continue to see remote working and decentralizations from cities to some degree. Still feel like urban centers are going to, are going to continue to, to, to run because um, international demand for those properties is going to displace and push outward. Um, and then I think when, uh, when we're talking about what, what could potentially be a big risk to, to, the, to the upcoming marketplace, um, you know, there's not many, I'd probably share the perspective uh, with many on this panel, but there's one area that, that I'm frustrated as a, as a British Columbian, as a Canadian, it's about the lack of accountability as it relates to our housing supply and uh, the short-sighted uh, supply levers that are not being or sorry, the short-sighted short uh, demand levers that are being constantly meddled with. And uh, that's, that kind of follows up Cameron's position. But um, if we don't get on top of this and we don't start holding municipalities accountable to production of, of housing, uh, we're in a, a really big problem four to five years from now. Um, I think that what I would like to do, unless there's any other comments or questions from the panelists, what I'd love to do is just flip it over. We have a handful of questions. There's, there's probably too many to get to. So I'm, I'm gonna choose um, uh, three. Uh, to, to start with, but um, thanks again for everyone for sharing. I know that there's been um, uh, a fair amount of direct conversation that's happened with uh, myself and Cameron in terms of text messages. So thank you for not listening to the recommendation of using the chat, um, but we're gonna get to them anyways. Guys. I'm excited about, it. there's a couple of really good ones. Um, the, the first one uh, is, is gonna come uh, to Steve uh, and it's talking about, I'm paraphrasing here because it's quite a long question, but for the most part, it's talking about the gentrification that's happening in the South Okanagan uh, around Penticton. It feels like those younger demographics are Gen X's that are coming with an entrepreneurial skill set and they're, resh they're reshaping parts of those cities. Is that true, Steve? Are you feeling that right now? Not particularly, no. I mean, we, we know we've got, uh, again, a lot of the younger people I'm finding are wanting to be in larger centers. Um, so, you know, we don't have um, a big tech base here. Uh, and so I would say that, you know, the, the younger generation typically are gravitating to Kelowna or the lower mainland. And really what we're feeding on is more, again, the people that have started their family. They want to get out of the city and come to the, to the Okanagan, to a smaller city. Right. So like that 35, is it fair to say that that 35 to say, you know, mid forties? Yeah, I would say it's, uh, it's yeah, late thirties to to 50, you know, you know, some of the people that started their family later in life, but it's in that, I'd say 37 to, to about 50. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm looking at this, uh, the next question, and this is, uh, this is for Taylor. Taylor, what do you think uh, concrete high rise is selling at uh, 12 months from now in Kelowna? We just averaged at 875 a square foot in Caban, and that was a six story. Um, we focus on building larger homes in that one, more of a comfortable live work. I think that you're going to be pushing over a thousand square feet in the next year. I know Aqua was, was just under that. Mobile is coming out in the 900s. So I think you're going to be over a thousand bucks a square foot with the developers focusing on building smaller spaces um, to push that price per square foot up. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, the next question, this is, a, this is a good one. This is for Maggie. Um, Maggie, this is a snapshot question. Um, have um, uh, inter has an international buyer, um, specifically China, uh, Japan, and 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 more Asian uh, locate uh, uh, Asian countries found Whistler yet? And if they have not, do you believe that they will? We're seeing so many more 
um, South Asian people in Whistler. Not necessarily buying, some yes. I mean, it's not in extreme numbers, but they're definitely looking. And I think one of the things we have to be very clear about, skiing is coming to Asia quite just, just now really. It's all, all a new thing for them. They've got the Winter Olympics coming up next. Um, so China is definitely going to be more interested in skiing. They do like quality real estate. So we are definitely going to see more Asian buyers here. We haven't seen the likes of the Vancouver market, how they saw an extreme amount of Asian buying. But now that their children, a lot of them who've been here and understand our Western culture and the skiing importance of skiing, their families are now looking to come and, and buy something too. So that in itself will keep, as I said earlier, I see the upper end of the market being fueled more than anything else. And I think that will be part of it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Um, I'm gonna do two more questions. Uh, Cameron, this one's for you. Um, when you look at the whole of the lower mainland, if there was one pocket that you believe there's considerable value in today, um, what would you say it is? I would say that um, the center of the bell curve has really moved up, Actually, you know, well, right down to the, you know, uh, the most affordable real estate. So uh, uh, it's the really, it's the luxury segment that's lagged and it hasn't popped yet. Um, and I believe that similar to the international demand that, that Maggie mentioned, um, you know, that immigration um, that, that I spoke of earlier, um, it's coming from more densely populated areas. It's coming from very densely populated cities, the vast majority of it, and they're very comfortable with, with um, our, our uh, most densely, uh, our, our most densely populated areas throughout the greater Metro Vancouver area. So I see places like downtown Vancouver having upside, West Side, West Van having lots of upside. So I see our high-end market is going to play catch up. There's one thing, if I can jump in, because it just occurred to me, many of you may not know, we don't have a foreign bias tax in Whistler. Yes. Not right now, that could change, yeah. of course. Yeah. But right now it's more attractive to somebody to come here who is coming from China or from Hong Kong. You know, it, it's 20% it's, it's less. So, and we don't have the empty home, homeowners tax either. So we're, we're in a very nice position but as you know, governments change things quite rapidly. So we can't, can't think, I think that will not end. I, that's a great point. And I think there's confusion sometimes when the media talks about it or people speak about uh, you know, buyers buying from the Asia Pacific and just this conversation about offshore buyers versus immigration. When I talk about immigration, these, these, um, these buyers are uh, uh, permanently coming into Canada. So they are either coming in as permanent residents to Canada, living here, um, and making this their primary residence. It's not a, it's not a, you know, of course, of course, you know, they, they believe in the capital value of the real estate and, and we call it, you know, we've always called it as uh, Vancouver and Canada's blue chip real estate in, in the minds of an immigrant buyer that, that uh, comes from a place that, uh, you know, they, they're having a flight of safety, a place to park some money, but, but they are immigrating here and living here, living in those homes. I'm, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm deviating here, Maggie, but I have to ask the question, what percentage of, of buyers um, that are operating that marketplace, I believe you said you had 122 listings active, um, what percentage are foreign um, uh, or purchasing from outside of Canada today? Oh, we're still small. It's still very much um, Canadian driven buyers. Mm -hmm. We have a small percentage, but... Of, sorry, a small percentage of foreign buyers, but that is going to shift again once they can start traveling and that's going to be happening quite soon. The one thing I said earlier, which did surprise me that we didn't have more American buyers when the border opened to the Americans. Right. I, I thought we would see more. Right. So potentially some build up there uh, of demand that will at some point release. Yeah. Um, last question here, Steve, this one's at you. Um, in, in the... Uh, in the South Okanagan, when you think about waterfront, what neighborhood should someone be looking at if they're thinking about long-term appreciation on the water? 
typically with waterfronts, you can't go far wrong if you're on either uh, Skaha or Okanagan Lake. So some beautiful waterfronts in Aramata. Um, there's only two waterfront properties in Penticton that are on Okanagan Lake. Um, and then you spin around to the Summerland side, Summerland and Trout Creek are, you know, very popular. Uh, going to Okanagan, sorry, to Skaha Lake at the south end, again, another great lake for water skiing and, and so forth. And, uh, and that, again, you, I think the, the prime properties, which are the non-east side road, east side road takes you from Penticton to Okanagan Falls, but it's a busy road. So those waterfronts are a little less desirable because of the traffic flow. So there's a few little cul-de-sacs and pockets where you have some real nice peace and quiet. Again, those are the prime pieces of real estate. So Penticton off the East Side Road, Caledon, some nice waterfront, and um, uh, Naramata and Summerland are very strong on Okanagan Lake. If you had to choose one between those four, Trout Creek, Naramata, um, Caledon East Side Road, what would you say? Um, probably the Summerland. I, I like the um, exposure on the Summerland side. You get the you get the morning sun, and then late in the day, you're not you know sitting out on your deck getting hit by the forty degree August uh, afternoon. So that's a real nice exposure. The other is there the strip of uh, at the very north end of Skaha Lake, there's about uh, 14 homes on South Beach Drive in Sudbury. And uh, those homes have direct south exposure and those are really prime, nice sandy beach and very quiet. Yeah, the ones you're speaking of. And I, I, and I, I don't think that those two properties on uh, Penticton, Okanagan Lake are selling anytime soon. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to wrap it here. Uh, I'd obviously like just to first of all thank our panelists um, for participating in the market meetup. This was uh, this was uh, I, I hope of of incredible value to all of our viewers. Um, if there was some value that was uh, that was earned um, today, please do your, do your very best to uh, uh, to share it. And we will be populating everyone's inboxes um, with not only a recording of this but also an executive summary of the key points so that it's really easy for you to share within your teams. Now, in order to do that though, there is one small um, hoop that you have to jump, jump through and that is gonna be a quick survey, of just what worked today and some of uh, the opportunities for us to gather a bit of perspective from our viewers in terms of what they think uh, of the various markets that we looked at today and where they think that some of those markets might be going. Uh, so you can expect that in the next 72 hours. Um, Unless there's anything else that the panelists have to add, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for the time and the energy today. I, just, I, I, I think that there's a lot of great discussion and um, looking forward to, to making sure that we can share your contact information also in those, in those uh, email correspondences, just so that if anyone wanted to have an opportunity to connect with you directly, um, uh, we'll encourage them to do so. Um, thank you guys so much. Wonderful time. Um, looking forward to the next one. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.